it's indeed a pleasure to welcome a very, very special guest today on the interview right here on ET Now. Mr. Alan Yarrow, the Honorable Lord Mayor of London, joins us on the show. Thanks very much for talking to us. A pleasure to have you on in India. I hope you've had a great trip so far. Uh, I will begin with your, you, you, you've been wearing multiple hats over decades, but I'm going to begin with the hat that you're presently wearing. And that's, of course, the Lord Mayor of London itself. Uh, uh, London is a great investment destination. You're making a huge sales pitch here uh, for all uh, considerable terms. Uh, why is it that people should look at London? Let's maybe begin with a very basic question. London is a financial centre. It is the international financial centre of the world. Mm. Uh, we have a cluster of extremely good markets uh, and professions. We've got accountancy, we've got uh, the law, legal situation, le legal position, we've got the markets, we've got the metal markets, we've got the bond markets, we've got the equity markets. The whole cluster of London offers the international, the global world, a lot of liquidity. On top of that, we handle something like two trillion of international funds which are invested outside the country mm -hmm. so that we are an important destination for people who want to raise money for infrastructure and for developing their own countries. How is your sales pitch or how is your uh, take on why to invest or be in London different from what your predecessors have done so far? The world has changed considerably in the last four to five years. It's gone through this uh, tumultuous phase. Uh, how is your pitch different from any other? Well, London always has had the advantage of, of language, mm. uh, the time clock, uh, the legal stru structure, and the legal structure is important because it's the law of contract that's important. So people feel comfortable, actually, with the fact that it comes from London. On top of that, we've got the world-recognized status of the, uh, the currency professions and the legal professions, and going through that, the actuarial professions. So we've also got the full phalanx of the supporting professions to go behind the marketplaces. It's all about everything being in the same place. It's a one-stop shop. Uh, do you believe that uh, given the financial crisis that the world has seen, has it lost some of its sheen? Has some of the sheen gone to Asia or is this actually intact because a destination like London is always going to be safer than what can happen in places like, like a Hong Kong or a Singapore? Well, I think the most important thing to recognize is mistakes were made. Uh, we made mistakes uh, and there's no doubt that a lot of other people also made mistakes. Because we are the largest international market, people look to London to see what they do about making, putting those mistakes right. Mm. Uh, first of all, you've got to admit the fact that there's problems. You've got to diagnose what the problems were and be seen to doing something about them. And we are disciplining people who misbehaved and we will continue to discipline people who misbehave. So it's not about the fact that actually things went wrong. Things do go wrong in markets. They go on quite often in markets. That's right. It's about trust in the organisation to put those errors right. And I think people look to London not only to see what they've done, but actually to ask what went wrong, why it went wrong, so they don't make the same mistakes themselves. We have people in London. You might have one person in Mumbai or even in Delhi worrying about a particular issue. We've got 50 people in London worrying about the same thing. We have over 2 million people involved in financial services in, in the UK. If I can ask you this question, that while London has learned from its mistakes and corrected them in the past and also in the present, has the world done the same thing? You think Wall Street has learned from the mistakes it makes or does it continue to make the same mistakes? Well, markets are, are almost live animals. Mm. They're, they're, they're constantly evolving. It's not as if something is stable. And by definition, markets will overstep the line occasionally and either have to be brought back because it's the client's been forgotten. And that's what happened in the, in the, in after 2000, about 2007. Mm. They seem to misunderstand where the client was in this argument. We've learned that to our own cost. So the client now comes up very much more quickly as being the main responsible. Uh, the attitude has got to make sure the client gets the best possible advice and service. You know, why I ask you this question is, and I'm digressing a little, but why I ask you this question is that you are somebody who's worn an investment banker's hat before in the past. You understand how financial markets work, what kind of animals and beasts they can be. Uh, we're seeing something happen and unfold in India. You know, equity markets are euphoric. Uh, there's global liquidity that's flowing into the country. What are the lessons that India should be learning from places like a London or even a New York for that matter? Well, it's not, just, it's not just London, I'm sure it's any market. Mm. I mean, when expectations get ahead of delivery, that leads to disappointment. That's right. So the markets nearly always overreact both ways. And consequently, if you've got a euphoric market, people have got to be sensible about saying that this is emotional and therefore one's got to be realistic about the likely returns. And so consequently, all markets overstretch themselves. Mm. I think at the moment, 
the markets are looking quite good. The fact is that the whole Modi initiative at the moment is being viewed very favorably by international investors. And that's why I think the markets are very strong. I was actually going to come to Mr. Modi in a while from now, but because you've uh, given me my cue for that question, I will finish the topic and move any further. Uh, there was, you know, India was on the investment uh, radar for some time. It fell off that radar because of what we did internally uh, in India. Then, of course, there's this fantastic majority that Mr. Modi has voted to in office. Has perception about India changed in the last six, uh, six odd months? Because uh, I heard your speech uh, at the conclave, and, and you spoke greatly about the East-West partnership. Uh, how has the perception about this government changed uh, from somebody who comes from London? Well, I have to say, actually, I was born also in the Far East, so I'm in London at the moment. Right. The, rea the reality is that I've got no doubt that India has always been this slightly slumbering giant, mm. uh, and it's, it's always been one of the most exciting potential stories ever since I've been involved in the Stock Exchange. Mm. And we have these false dawns. We've had these false dawns in the past. But right at this point in time, I think we've now got an initiative, a leadership, from what I can see, an, asp an aspiration, which is not just political. In other words, it seems to try go across political parties. Right. And consequently, I think we're now seeing the best possible chance of India actually getting a lot of the historic legacy issues put right. Everyone's around to blame everybody else for issues. But actually, at the end of the day, we can only blame ourselves for things that aren't happening. Considering you're in public life, you do understand political compulsions and how they guide uh, any kind of reform agenda anywhere in the world, whether it's in London, whether it's in New York, in the Far East, or even in New Delhi for that matter. Uh, there is a lot of political opposition. A lot of people insist that's just political rhetoric. There isn't opposition to reforms but because you know, who, what, people who were sitting once in the Treasury benches and now they're sitting across it, there is bound to be opposition. How optimistic are you that the Modi government will get through the economic reforms, the economic legislations that it has possible, given the political opposition? Is, is there a sense of concern from the mind of the global investment community on that? Well, I think I mentioned before, markets are driven by expectation. Mm. And I think expectation needs to be managed. The reality is that the amount of work that needs to be done is humongous. I mean, That's there's right. a huge amount of work to be done. Everything starts off with a euphoric kickoff point. And the most important thing is to get expectations down to a level of deliverability. In other words, don't let expectations run ahead of what you can deliver. And I'm sure he's got that. I mean, Aaron Jaitley the other day did say that actually it's going to take time to get these processes to work. That's right. Equally, don't lose the momentum. And that is the point, I think, is, is the most critical point as far as they're concerned. The momentum has to be seen to be maintained. Steady and momentum. No quick changes, just progressive, iterative, direct change. And people then understand they can look forward. It's about predictability. If it's not predictable, it starts to impact. But if it's predictable, you can see it's consistent. Mm. I think that's the most important point. <laughs> India wants to open up insurance, but you have certain specific ideas how India should go about this. A, I want you to elaborate on that, and B, uh, uh, the question that I want to ask you from the point of view of some of the Indian companies who are listening to you very intently is, are companies based out of UK, are, are the UK insurance giants excited about this opportunity? Yes, and they have been for some time. I mean, people like the Prudential and so on have very big businesses in the Far East. That's right. Uh, and they also have a, a joint agreement, joint uh, venture here in, in India. Mm. The fact is that I think it's very, very tricky this, that the, the, the Modi government understands, I think, very well what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen a relaxation of the shareholdings uh, going, going up from 20% up to 49%. That is a good initial step. That's right. Uh, and, but the reality of the question is, do you actually invest in a country when you haven't got control? Mm -hmm. So the real question is, each company is going to be looking to see if they think the government's going to allow it to go above 51% at some point. So there will be a question mark mm. as to where that's going to go. If they can see it being relaxed further, uh, I think they will continue to invest probably quite aggressively. But if they don't see it going further, the real question is if there's any change. So we're now waiting to see what's happened. I think they're going to have to act. Each company is going to take their own interpretation. But it's definitely seen as a good move. It's a good move as far as 49% is concerned, and we've debated this question with the government as well for a while, that whether it's in defense or whether it's in insurance, unless you're not going to give control to a foreign operator, why is he going to sink in the multi-billion dollars that you want him to? Uh, which is why my question is that, will 49% attract the investment that the government intends to be attracted? Well, we have to wait and see. Fair point indeed. I'm going to move can I make, away. Can I just make uh, my sure. insurance yes. point, if I may? And that is that... Uh, 
the, corp the corporation of Lloyd's, that is the, the Lloyd's insurance market, mm -hmm. effectively is a very important market as far as India is concerned right. because they look at the, the specialised risks. Mm. And what they do, they are effectively the regulator. And what they've asked for is that they are recognised and that their members become effectively grandfathered into the Indian market. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue which I know the Corporation Lawyers is talking to the government about at the moment. Have you taken it up with the government in your interactions? Well, I might do tomorrow. I'm seeing Aaron Jaitley tomorrow. But it's an issue which is certainly in the forefront of their minds at the moment. Uh, there's something else that's on the radar when you meet the market regulator, SEBI, uh, in your visit. And because there's been a lot of talk about the structure of incentives for financial services sector, and considering London has learned its lessons well, uh, and, and you have been able to tackle it in the past, what kind of lessons will you share it with India? Because we are seeing our financial services also begin to grow. Uh, not to the volumes of where it is in London, but yes, it's beginning to swell up. What kind of lessons can be learnt? Because we are beginning to see, and you know, this this emanated out of the multi-billion-dollar scandals that one did see overseas. In India, before those scandals really come to light, what is it that you can share with SEBI that that, that can perhaps take care of a mess like this? Well, I think it, it makes sure the incentives are properly uh, placed. In other mm. words, that they aren't necessarily on the individual, or they are over a longer term. Uh, and it also, it's a share of profitability, and that means that there is detriment as well as gain. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it became a one-way option as far as the, 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 the US and the UK was concerned. That's right. And the other thing also to bear in mind that the whole concept of having variable pay mm. is it's trying to keep the fixed overheads of the organisation down to a level. So when the market goes through a down cycle, that they don't have a fixed overhead which is too high. Mm. And the danger is if you start restricting the variable pay, it forces it down onto fixed pay and raises the fixed costs. And that effectively means that company is less stable. So sure. variable pay is there for a reason. It's there because it is variable. I am going to turn focus and talk to you about something that irks a lot of global investors, that one issue alone many people believe is responsible for the kind of mess India created with its own investment climate, and that is the whole retrospective tax legislation. The government has been on record, and the finance minister has said it time and again, uh, that they do not intend to raise any more tax demands via that retrospective tax legislation, even though it has not been given a burial, so to say. Yes, it's a quiet burial. Uh, would you have liked the Indian government to undo the retrospective tax issue because it concerns one of your biggest companies, Vodafone, here? I mean, there's no doubt that, that, that uh, yes, obviously one would have liked the retrospective tax issues to be confronted probably more aggressive. But actually, I'm not here in a position to tell the government of India what to do. Right. They're doing an awful lot at the moment, mm -hmm. and they're doing it at the speed they want to do it at. And I think there has been progress. They've made an indication that there isn't going to further retrospective taxation, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian, the, the, the Vodafone issue is very much an issue between Vodafone and the government. So I don't particularly want to be drawn on that. So, but, from a, but from the other hat that you wear, which is, which is uh, a representative from the UK government, uh, you wouldn't want to throw your weight behind Vodafone. You still think it's, it's a matter between one company and the government of India here? Well, no, I think it's a broader question, actually. Mm. Uh, the value of your shares and your companies in this country they are effectively a reflection of the predictability of regulation right. and the transparency of governance and also figures mm. and the ability to kind of forecast what the likely earnings are going to be. If any impediment comes into those three issues, mm. it effectively reflects in the valuation of the company is concerned. That's right. It means the cost of capital goes up and that is not good for any company. Including a Vodafone. I want to talk to you about two more things before I move back to your priority as the Lord Mayor of London. And that is, of course, uh, I was speaking to one of your colleagues and I asked him that, honestly, tell me, what do you feel about Chorus and JLR? Are they British companies? Are they Indian companies? Are they global MNCs, the term that's often abused? But let me just come back to Chorus and JLR. Um, uh, considering these, are, these were the acquisitions made in the past, uh, have they been successful in culturally uh, integrating with the British economy, with the British population? How would you rate it? Well, going back to that extremely good conference which you ran yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, and I think I answered the question there, we are extraordinarily proud of what the Tata Group have done uh, with JLR, mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure we'll do a good job with Chorus. But the reality is that, and that pride is in the fact that there has been a real integration. The aspiration is there for the company. They've shown what was and is a wonderful trademark in both Jaguar and Land Rover That's right. uh, of being a stunning world beater. Mm. And if it hadn't been for Tata coming in, they would never see what we've got now. It's probably one of the most successful growing automotive companies in the world. That's right. And that is down to 
Indian money coming into our country mm -hmm. and actually helping us to develop what is now the premium brand product in the world as far as four-wheel drive cars are concerned. But do you believe India are filthy deal makers? And I'm using that word filthy with some amount of uh, uh, liberty here because we make a mess of acquisitions sometimes. We go and acquire companies that we can't manage. Uh, then we pay a price for it. Uh, quite contrary, sometimes we do acquire assets that we can manage, which are even six times our size, which is chorus. Uh, while JLR is the bet that has paid for Tata Motors, chorus hasn't done the same thing for Tata Steel, has it? Well, steel is a very different industry. That's right. Uh, and you know, it's, it's a reflection also of what the um, currency is doing. It's a very currency reflective industry. Mm. Uh, th there will be changes. I mean, the fact at the end of the day is, you asked me a question about how they, they'd be integrated. There are some extraordinarily successful Indian companies in the UK. That's right. And you know, the Tata Group is one of them. But there are plenty of others who you should also be very proud of. And it's not just India should be proud of them. We are also proud of them in the UK because they've, they're employing people. They're paying people, and they're actually reflecting very well on the country. I'm going to go back and uh, talk to you about life back in London, and that's, of course, uh, your priorities as the Honourable uh, Lord Mayor of that city. Uh, I, I want to begin by talking to you about, other than uh, making a huge sales speech for London and attracting global investment there and making these East-West partnerships with places like India and other places in the world, uh, what else is priority? Because London is a beautiful city. I mean, on a personal note, I love that city. Uh, it does cry for infrastructure at some places. Uh, what kind of, uh, what is your priority uh, with the office that you assume right now? You mean talking about infrastructure in London? You That's mean? right. Well, London has probably got, I mean, let's go back to the Olympics for a second. You That's know. right. Uh, I can tell you that nobody thought it was going to be delivered on time to start right. with. They didn't think it was going to be a success. But the skeptics were proven wrong. And completely wrong. I mean, it was the most wonderful event. Delivered right. on time, below budget. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely terrific. And it wasn't just the Olympics, the Paralympics, there was the Commonwealth Games True. in Glasgow. Now we go on to infrastructure issues. There's Crossrail. It's mm -hmm. the biggest infrastructure transaction taking place in Europe at the moment. I'm not sure it isn't partly most of the world. It's a phenomenal bit of engineering. That's right. And in the middle of so May next year, it's well not the actual two tubes actually meet up in the middle. We'll mm -hmm. have to wait and see, but the chances are they will do. But you know, there is a, there is a very, very exciting infrastructural spend going on at the moment. We have got the engineers. We've got the engineers and we've got the design engineers. We are actually mm -hmm. very good at design and also implementing these things. Mm -hmm. So I think infrastructure-wise, the UK needs more roads, it needs more rail. We've got HS2, possibly HS3, which are two railway lines, one going up to the north uh, and one going across the middle of the, of the UK. They're both very important lines at some point which are going to be built. So infrastructure is going to be an important part of keeping a modern country up to speed with the developments that are going on. What kind of lessons would you share with a country like India? You know, for the first time we're talking about urbanization with some amount of seriousness. For the first time we're talking about smart cities being priority for the government. What kind of lessons would you want to, uh, you know, you share with the Indian government as they try to do what London has done in the past? Well, I mean, part of the problem is planning. Let's be honest. Right, yes. Planning is a nightmare, mm. whatever country you're in. As far as it's certainly not easy in the UK, and I'm sure it's not probably easy in India. Mm. The reality is, you know, a good registration of title, making sure you know who owns the property, mm -hmm. the ability actually to deliver a clean contract of title to the person who's buying it, and making sure the planning events don't take too long to put people off from actually putting infrastructure in place. Mm -hmm. And all those issues are critically important to getting infrastructure to run. In the UK, the good thing about Crossrail was it went right underground, right. so there weren't any planning issues. Hmm. But when you're doing something on the surface, it can actually be a real impediment. I'm going to talk to you more now about um, what's happening in the world globally, because that impacts each one of us, including uh, Londoners, so to say. But uh, the, you know, the world was just beginning to come out of this great recession. Uh, we were just about beginning to breathe easy uh, till the Eurozone started throwing up these fault lines all over again. And, and the concern now in the world is, uh, can the Eurozone threaten the economic recovery that the world is seeing? Do you lose sleep over that? Well, I mean, the Eurozone, I mean, that, let's, the Euro is a new currency. Uh, and new currencies have to be tested by crises. Mm. You don't have confidence in a currency unless you've seen it go through a very difficult set of circumstances. This is 28 countries, actually, effectively, who ultimately will be in the Eurozone. But of those ones who are in the Eurozone now, as you know, the UK is not in the Eurozone. That's right. Those ones in the Eurozone now have got to tackle whether or not those weaker countries, which actually didn't join necessarily on the right prospectus, mm -hmm. are going to be able to resolve 
issues for the Eurozone is in, in general. There's no doubt that economic growth in the Eurozone is very disappointing, mm -hmm. but we know that Draghi and uh, other people from the central bank are trying to do their best to try and ease the strain. None of these European countries have a very sophisticated equity market, I might point out. They are much more bank financed. That's right. And they don't have the same access to capital as perhaps the UK and the US has had. It's interesting that those equity based economies tend to be performing better because they've got access to more capital. Uh, you've given me the cue for my next question because you mentioned Mario Draghi there and uh, there is this huge expectation that sooner than later the stimulus is going to come from ECB. Is it fair to bank on that stimulus as far as the economic region is concerned? He's doing what he can. I've got no doubt he's a very experienced man actually mm -hmm. and I met him a number of times. He's very good at his mm -hmm. job and I'm sure he's going to actually recognise what changes he needs to make. You know, last year, and this is 2013, uh, when the Davos conference happens, the World Economic Forum, and I happened to be there, and they, uh, everybody was questioning whether Eurozone can survive as a single block, so to say. Do you think that threat has receded? Uh, it's still here. Uh, I mean, the fact is, it's going to continue to be here. I'm sure it will survive. Um, but the reality is, it's going to go through more bumps in the future. And the question is, the credibility of the currency is based on how those crises are confronted. I'm going to ask you a direct question. UK is not a part of the Eurozone, and there was plenty of clamor that it should or should not. Uh, in hindsight, and because we have the pleasure of hindsight, always in hindsight, uh, do you believe it was a decision well taken? It was right the UK came out of the Eurozone when it did. And I think that's been manifestly shown. There was a 30% uh, devaluation which took place, which mm -hmm. people forget. That actually basically based the, the economy, actually got kicked it off, gave it a kickstart. We needed the currency as a way of actually getting the economy going. We didn't want to lose that stimulus. Fair point indeed. Uh, two quick questions on capital markets. A London Stock Exchange listing was considered to be the thing uh, in the past. Uh, do you believe it continues to be the thing or has it lost some of, some of its sheen? And what really happened with Alibaba? Uh, it listed at the US Stock Exchanges. It was planning to list on the London Stock Exchanges. But just for the record, uh, what really happened there? Well, it's a very good question. Um, and uh, it's frustrating in a sense. Mm. But the reality is that we have, yes, the answer is yes, I do believe the London Stock Exchange is, is the premium place for an international company to come and list. Mm -hmm. So let's get that understood to start with. And the reason why they didn't come to uh, London, I, I can't give you exact reason, but my understanding is that we have very strict rules on the shareholding. And there were, two, there were a number of different classes of share, or two classes of share. That's right. The board of directors needs to be appointed in under... British governance rules by the, by the shareholders. And that was not going to be the case with Alibaba. Now, if you want to get into our premium market, there are some quite strict rules because we need to have transparency mm -hmm. and fair play. And we want to be that, tra that transparency is the shareholder feeling that they own the big decisions in the company and the way it's going. After all, they own the company mm -hmm. and therefore they have the right to that. So we believe that all shares rank pari passu. We don't believe in two different classes of shares. But that is the premium market. When we come down to the lower markets, like the AIM market and so on, there are different rules which apply. Mm -hmm. And we have these graduated markets. But if you want to go to the premium market to get the best rating, that's right. that is where the government's rules are much tougher. And that's perhaps why transparency pays a price there. I have a last question to ask of you. And because you've been an investment banker yourself, you're now at the core of what happens in the financial world because you, um, you, 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 know, you are the Lord Mayor of London. Uh, it was always said, banks too big to fail. Uh, do you think banking has learned a lesson from the crisis that one saw unfold in the world? They've been at the core of all the mess. Do you think the lessons have been learned, whether it's a bank based out of Wall Street or for that matter, London or anywhere else in the world? Listen, as I said right at the beginning, mm. things went wrong. People misbehaved. Mm. But it wasn't just the banks. You know, banks just happen to be people who you can blame because they're still around That's and right. they've got money. Mm -hmm. And so they get fined. But there are all sorts of number of people who actually misbehaved. The reality is they lost sight of who the customer was, as I said. And too big to fail. We'll know, when we, we'll know we've succeeded in what's happened. It hasn't happened yet when actually people are allowed to make mistakes and banks are allowed to go bust. That's right. And right now, we're in neither of those two positions. So the reality is that we as a business involved in markets expect people to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But right now, we've got to get ourselves to a position where banks are allowed to go bust and they aren't systemic. That's right. So there's a constant divorce taking place between deposit takers and people who are principal risk takers. So are you here saying that as long as there's no systemic risk, you should test banks and let them go bust if they make mistakes? 
quite absolutely right. That's exactly what should happen. I have a last question to ask of you. You were asked this question at the conclave yesterday and uh, you gave a one word answer, but I'm going to push you any further. The World Cup is right around the corner. Uh, there is no Sachin Tendulkar on our side, but there's Alistair Cook on yours. Do you expect England to win the World Cup? That's point number one. And do you expect it to win it under Alistair Cook? Well, the answer is certainly yes. And under the captain? <laughs> I don't want to be drawn with the captain. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for talking to us. Can I just say us? one thing, sure. if I just conclude, I think, which I do want to say. Yes. And that is that, that I want it basically understood that this is a partnership. This is a very, very important partnership right. between the UK and India. Mm -hmm. And I think we can offer support in any number of issues to help India to go for the next leap. And it's, it's, we are here to help. We have got an interest. And what the Indians, effectively, who come to UK have done for us, we'd like to have the opportunity also to do for India. That's a rather beautiful note to end this interaction on. Thank you very much for Thank talking you. to us. Pleasure. Lovely. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.